I just want to say uh, congrats on um, 40 years of working with PETA and all your success. It's a real honor to have you on. Oh, it's my pleasure entirely. 40 years has gone by in a snap. So I'm looking forward to the next 40. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be 111, but that's okay. There we go. We can do it, especially on a vegan diet, right? That's it. I wanted to ask you, how, how are you doing with like all this craziness with this year, COVID and the whole pandemic? And how has it affected the work that you're doing with PETA? Well, we've never slowed down and we found other opportunities to jump on. And I've actually, I mean, aside from all the horrible bits of what this means to have a pandemic, I'm pretty excited about how when we were really locked down, animals were enjoying their world so much more. I'm really excited about things like the cancellation of the running of the bulls in Pamplona, cancellation of rodeos, cancellation of horse races. They're coming back now. But there were so many things. The Texas Livestock Show was canceled. It was just a wonder, wonderful thing for, for animals. But we've been outside every slaughterhouse. And I just object to the press calling them meat packing plants. They aren't where meat is packed. They are where animals are slaughtered and cut up into bits. So we've been outside all the slaughterhouses. We continue to be outside them with the Grim Reaper or the, um, the devil or whatever, saying you're killing workers, you're killing animals. There's no excuse for this. And our overseas offices, our affiliates in Asia, have been in Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, capturing footage of the wet markets. And so I'm very pleased that some of them have closed. Most of them are still open. Um, we've shown dogs, monkeys, cats, parrots, pangolins, bats, all for sale together, all miserable and sick. And we are trying to close the ones in New York and in San Francisco, too, because there's no excuse for them either. And of course, we have had a very good surge in um, pushing for vegan uh, eating and, and vegan clothing. And that's that's been exciting, too. So lo lots of things have been happening. And even though most of our people are working remotely, not all. We are in the field. We do have emergency services around the world. Um, we really have, I think we've been doing more than ever, and that's really saying something. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's good. I'm so glad to hear you guys haven't slowed down and you're still keeping up with your mission and continuing moving forward. But, you know, that is the sad thing. A lot of, um, I guess, uh, people who are not immersed in, in this lifestyle and realize what's going on, uh, these animals, like animals in slaughterhouses and the wet market, they have not taken a break from essentially the beginning of time, whether it was through wars, pandemics, hurricanes and floods, they've always been locked up and uh, been sold and killed essentially for monetary gains. So um, again, I thank you so much for what you're doing and, and keeping up the great work. Um, I want to ask you, what, what are your thoughts with, with the pandemic? Um, do you think it actually did originate from the wet market or from this so-called lab in Wuhan or any thoughts or um, updates from, from investigation? Well, most scientists, almost without exception, are ruling out the lab in Wuhan. I think it doesn't even matter if it did come from there because that would have meant they were tampering with wildlife. They were taking wildlife and mucking about with it and creating something they had no business to do. Um, but I do believe that it either came from that wet market in Wuhan, or there is a theory that it came from a pig factory farm just outside Wuhan or a fish market. What is common to all of them is that the blood, the feces, um, the viruses, the bacteria is washed down out of the cages with the animals in them, and it goes onto the ground and people either barefoot or in their shoes walk through it. And they tread those viruses and that bacteria all over the place. So what we know is that every pandemic has come from confining animals. The so-called Spanish flu, you know, 
which came from a pig farm in North America. Um, we've had avian flu from keeping birds together, chickens, turkeys. There was just an outbreak of turkey flu in North Carolina. We've had Ebola, SARS, even HIV, all came from capturing wildlife, domesticating animals, putting domestic and wildlife animals together, eating them, skinning them, doing all these things to them. Um, the blood and the guts and everything else mixing with what we touch, what we put on our faces, in our mouths, in our eyes, mucous membranes, and being airborne. And a, a lot of these things are airborne. So these mutations of viruses all originate in other species and have come back to bite us as humans who have so much greed and so much power that we have used it to bully and dominate and ruin the lives and the well-being of all the other species. And I'm glad you mentioned that it really doesn't matter if it came from the lab or the web market. The problem is, is the same because it's originating from animals. And like you mentioned, other plagues and even chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, which have kind of, you know, been pushed to the side a little bit with this being front and center at COVID-19. But any, anything really that has been truly devastating to our health has come from animal origin. So um, I think it's a big wake up call. And in a way, it's almost like karma. Um, you know, um, by by exploiting animals and, and doing this to them. Um, but but anyhow, I wanted to um, ask you and congratulate you about your new book, Animal Kind. It was published earlier this year. Um, tell me ab about that and uh, why you wrote that book. Oh, well, it's Animal Kind. It's remarkable discoveries about animals and revolutionary new ways that we can make a difference. We can be kind to them. I wrote it because it's our 40th anniversary at PETA, and Animal Kind actually is really good at um, telling you who animals are, that they're not tables and chairs, they have immense intelligence, communication skills, navigational abilities, all these stunning facts, jaw-dropping facts about them. And then in the second part of the book, I say now that we know who they are, there are things that we can do to help them. That's fantastic. Yeah. So tell me, tell me how your story started. I mean, you founded PETA 40 years ago. Uh, how did you first get into this? Did you grow up as a vegan or, um, you know, how did this all come about? Boy, I wish I had grown up as a vegan. You know, so many of us look back with regrets and think, oh, why didn't I figure that out? Um, but no, it took me a long time to get there. I did grow up loving animals, that, that phrase that sometimes doesn't mean you've connected the dots, it just means you're fond of them. There was a dog in my home when I was born, his name was Shawnee. He was older than me and we grew up together and we did everything together, he was like a brother. So he knew when I was sad, I knew when he was sad, you know, we knew when we were happy and playing together. We used to go in the car with my parents and both of us would get car sick at exactly the same time. They'd have to stop the car, we'd both get out. So we were bonded. And if you told me then you were going to do anything to hurt Shawnee, I would have done everything in my power to stop you. Um, so it was very hard for me later in life to realize that dogs just like Shawnee are cut open. They're in lab cages, like at Texas Tech sitting there they've been given a form of muscular dystrophy it's not a human form and they just drool they can't keep food in their mouths their limbs go weak they shake and they're on metal i mean how could you do that to shawnee or any other living being so i ate animals i wore animals i bought things that were tested on animals and i loved animals but there was nobody back then None of these wonderful activists to hand me a card or say something or show me a video. There wasn't the internet. So I think we've got all these fabulous powers now to change people, to wake them up, shake them up and say, hey, why are you doing that? Did you know? Because I wish someone had said it to me, but I had to have a series of experiences. 
And one by one, starting with lobsters who wiggled their antennae at me in a restaurant, and I ordered one, and that one came back to the table, and I put the meat in my mouth, and in the back of my mind, something must have triggered, and I thought, oh, I just killed this living being to eat, and all he could do, he couldn't speak my language, all he could do was wiggle his antennae at me, and I ignored it. So all these things made me bit by bit by bit stop doing this and that and the other. And by the time I got somewhere useful, I said, if it's taken me this long and all these experiences, there must be a lot of people like me who care about animals but haven't a clue how they're hurting them. Let me form a group, do the homework and say, guess what? If you buy this, you are hurting animals in these ways, but you can buy that and you're not hurting them. And so make it easy, but open people's eyes. And so that's how I formed Peter. Yeah. And I heard that you, you had just gotten a small group of people and just did it in your apartment. Am I correct? That is absolutely correct. It was five friends. And um, we all had read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. And that changed everything. Because until then, I thought you should be kind to animals, meaning you shouldn't starve your dog or tie a firecracker to a cat's tail or beat a horse. But once we read that, that said, hang on, animals are just other nations. They're other tribes. They're other individuals like you. They may not look exactly the same. I mean, they have eyes, they have a heart, they feel pain, but they're just like you. And it's only prejudice that makes you crush them, push them down, treat them as if they're hamburgers, handbags, uh, shoes that haven't been made yet. So think of them with respect in that way. And that changed everything for me. We all read the book and decided, okay, let's start the group and start talking to people about what they can do differently. And so we did. That's amazing. Yeah. So how we, how did you end up going just from like a small a small group to becoming this big organization and what I would say the largest animal advocacy organization? Well, I believe if you build it, they'll come. I don't believe that you ask for money, for example, in order to write a newsletter. Is that somehow or the other you have to show that you're going to do something and you care. And it can be very, very small. You just start out doing. And then other people notice and they come to help or they volunteer some time or they give you some funds or they say, oh, I have, you know, a, a copier at home. I can do that for you. Or I'm an artist. I can make your first. You do. And out of doing, not hoping, wishing, but doing, then others come to you and you grow and you use all the talent that you can find. And you're always grateful, not resentful, but grateful if anyone can give you five minutes or one hour or go to one demonstration. It all contributes. You know, it's like drops in a boiling pot is that eventually the whole thing is boiling. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy to think, you know, where, where have you guys have come from? And um, it started back in uh, what? It was 1980. Uh, so you probably have have seen a lot. Um, can you tell us like how th things were back then in terms of like just vegan options as well as the state of um, animal liberation, you know, um, and, and, you know, where you've come now, walk us through some of the changes that you've witnessed. Well, this is one of the things that uh, keeps me going and going strong. And I recommend it to everybody else is you look forward to what you want. You look to what you're doing now but you look back to see how far society has come in all movements, not just animal rights, but someone had to say, no, this isn't hopeless. I'm gonna push forward with this idea because I know I'm right. I'm gonna demand these changes. When we began, of course, there was no internet. There weren't even fax machines. <laughs> there was no mobile right. phone, <laughs> none of these things. In order to reach people, you had to stand on the street and hand them a leaflet. 
that was it. Or you, we, um, during President Reagan's inauguration, had a massive banner. And I remember the television station that was publicizing the inauguration actually read the slogan on our banner out on national television, not realizing at first what it was. They thought it was some patriotic thing, which it should be. And it was all about take back your mink, take back your pearls. And it was for animal liberation. And that put us on the map. Our first case was we just went to work as a volunteer in an animal laboratory, documented everything with a standard camera. Um, you know, there was nothing fancy back then. Um, and we took it to the police. We had a search warrant. We busted the place. We had a trial. That was so revolutionary that anybody could do something about animals in labs that it made the front page of newspapers around the world. And mail kept coming in saying, how can I help? It gave people inspiration. And of course, we said, here are the 50,000 things you can do to help. Choose some of them. Choose one of them. But back then, there was no soy milk. There was no oat milk, plant, no plant milks. If you wanted something vegan, you either had to go to a Loma Linda religious grocery store, and they were few and far between, or you had to go to a co-op. And they were few and far between. And you could get a block of tofu. There was one vegan cookbook called 10 Talents. There were, I don't think anybody even knew what the word vegan meant. You never heard it. You heard the word vegetarian. That was considered oddball, some religious thing, you know, like, oh, you must be Hindu. <laughs> and everybody wanted a fur coat, all women thought they would have arrived if they had a fur coat. Nobody had seen any pictures of the steel trap or the fur farms. And of course, everything has changed now. Kids would run onto the street to see Ringling come to town. Gone, gone, fur gone. Now we're talking about all these other things and vegan is everywhere. So we're knocking out experimentation. We have human lungs on a chip, heart on a chip human brain fragments in a Petri dish that are being grown structurally, human DNA on the internet. Everything has changed, but there's so much more that needs to change. And that means everybody has to be part of this, not be complacent. Yeah, that's crazy. So yeah, t tell me a little bit more about um, these alternatives to animal testing, because you know, that's such a big thing in the medical field. There are advocating for this as a necessity you know we need this for our medication in order you know for the sick to live or for our cosmetics to be safe you know for everyone especially children and the vulnerable so yeah t you have the floor take it away <laughs> well you know if you're watching uh, tv and the ads come on for every possible medication under the sun you just listen to the side effects and it can be fatal, almost everything. They have everything through to anaphylactic shock and death. And you have to ask yourself, would somebody really want to take that? Of course, we know, you're wearing the vegan shirt, you're vegan, I'm vegan, we know that the number one way to look after your health is to go low fat vegan. And the worst thing you could ever possibly put into your body is dairy in any form. It's a killer, absolute killer. So but oh, yeah. let's say you don't know any of that. And so you think I have to have medicines. The fact you see all those ads, and then you see ads from lawyers saying, if you've been hurt by this medicine, call this number and we will right. get it. Right. So put two and two <laughs> together and think maybe these drugs aren't being tested properly. And the fact is, 95%, this is not my figure, it's not an animal rights figure, this is a figure of the people who evaluate drugs, scientists who evaluate drugs, 95% of all the drugs that are given to human beings do not come out to be safe even though they tested safe on other species. We're different species. So today, you have animal experimenters who grew up, went to college, and that's what they learned. 
40 years later, they're still doing it. And nobody taps them on the shoulder and says, hey, Joe, um, you haven't found anything. Well, what you found is no good. Maybe you should stop. No, they carry on getting grants and they carry on paying their mortgage and whatever with this money. And we have to be smarter than that to say to our representatives, we've got high speed computers today. You can program them with human data, not data from a monkey or a rat or a dog. And you can get, res that's how we got the HIV cocktail is they were busy infecting chimpanzees, making them sick, putting them in isolation chambers. Eventually they discovered they don't get human HIV. They get SIV, a simian IV, which is not the same. And so all that work, all that money, all that suffering of those incredible animals who share 98% of our DNA, garbage. And that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. So then they tried high-speed computers programmed with human data, tr enter the human experience, epidemiological studies, and they got the HIV cocktail, not from animals. The same way they got cloned human skin, not from blow-torching pigs. Same way that they have treatment for cancer drugs, not from millions of mice and rats. You can cure cancer in them, but you can't cure in humans and vice versa but we got it from looking intelligently, using technology, using human data and human experience, and having the ability now to com combine different drugs and see what the effect is in human beings without hurting anyone. Right, and uh, you guys first initially got the spotlight about 40 years ago when you did the Silver Spring monkey case, right? Which, uh, uh, funny enough, it's not even like half hour away from where I'm Skyping you from right now. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I'm right here in Maryland. Oh. It's just insane to think that something like that could be happening essentially down the street, you know? Um, tell me tell me a little bit about the Silver Spring Monkey case because that was something that I guess no one at the time was really looking at animal research, correct? So you guys kind of shine the light on that. Absolutely. And it's in Silver Spring, Maryland, obviously Silver Spring Monkey's case. It was just the closest lab that I found in the USDA list to my apartment. So we just wandered over and volunteered there. And there were these macaque monkeys who had been taken from the Philippines, from the jungle, separated from their families, very traumatic, being kept in these tiny wire metal boxes there was a psychologist, and this is still legal, who opened up their backs and interfered with their nerves, which meant that some of them couldn't use one arm and some of them couldn't use either arm. The cages were so rusted and the wires were so bent that these monkeys, when they lost feeling in their hands and their fingers, had torn off their, the digits, their fingers. Most of them were missing fingers on both hands, every single monkey, because they'd torn them off on the wire. Some of them had died of gangrene poisoning. And the experiment of the psychologist who opened up their backs without one hour of medical training had thrown them into a vat of formaldehyde in a trash bin area and just put bricks on top of the trash lids and left them there. When we served the search warrant, we found their bodies and took the living monkeys out. What he had also done is convert a little refrigerator into a shock chamber, electric shocks. So he would put the monkeys in the chamber, close the door, he had a camera from the outside, and he would shock them. And in order to stop the electric shock, they had to use their bad arms to pick up raisins out of a tray that was in the, in the refrigerator. And if they couldn't manage to do it, they got shocked. And the whole refrigerator inside was covered with their blood. But he got tons of money and he would have carried on getting it if we hadn't stopped him. But let me say this, we've stopped that experiment and many, many more, but the system is rotten to the core. And just up the street from there, in Bethesda, Maryland, 
is Elizabeth Murray, who for the last 30 years has taken monkeys, wonderful, scared monkeys, interfered with their brains, cut into their brains, put them in a metal box, had a solid front come down in front of them. So they were in a box that they couldn't see out of. Suddenly opens the lid, opens that, that front, and there in front of them is a plastic, and they don't know it's plastic or rubber, spider or snake. And it drives them, the, there's nowhere they can go. They can't escape. They're absolutely petrified. And she has received over $13 million to conduct those stupid, cruel experiments on the psychology of fear in monkeys who are brain damaged for 30 years. And because of COVID, we can't even get an appointment to see Dr. Frances Collins, who is her boss, the head of NIH. And we've had neurologists, primatologists, everybody try to reach him and say, cut this funding off. But he's unresponsive. So everyone can get involved in that. We, we're leafleting her neighborhood. You know, we're calling her up and saying, what are you doing? We're writing to NIH. We're doing everything we can. We need everybody. It's on peter.org. Get involved, please. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, I think I think we've come a long way with animal testing, as you mentioned before. Um, and going back in time, though, in the '80s, I wouldn't. I would say probably at that time, most people didn't really see you guys as as heroes. In fact, they probably called you extremists and calls you a bunch of names and my my favorite one that people always reference is people eating tasty animals as if PETA stands for that which is ridiculous like how, how can people laugh at you know the suffering of these living beings it it breaks my heart and um well I, first of all I just wanted to ask you uh what are some of the reactions that you guys have gotten from the public and even the government and, you know, how have you guys kind of cope with that as an organization? I think looking back again is the best thing to do because the very first time we said you shouldn't wear fur because it comes from animals in these awful situations. Let us show you the photos. Let us show you the it, what were movies then of how they're caught in these traps and farmed. People laughed, people mocked when we sat down in front of fur stores and were dragged away by the police, people said, ah, oh. when we had our first um, runway takeover and got on the runway and showed our hands had blood on them and said, this is what is fur, um, people just mocked. But now everybody knows, even the biggest designers in the world, like Prada, Gucci, Galliano, they don't use fur anymore. It's gone. And you can't talk to anyone and have them defend fur. So again, I think it's you look back and you know that over time, attitudes change and they change about women, they, about people of other religions, races, about people with disabilities. They're going to change and they already are changing about the other animals on the face of the earth. We just have to make sure people know there's a principle involved. If you're against bullying and domination and prejudice and bias and exploitation, are you just against it when you relate to it? Like, am I just against women's exploitation because I'm a woman? No, I'm against the principle. And so if you're against it, the principle is important. The victim's identity doesn't matter. So if you look back, you know that if you keep pushing the facts, if you keep saying what's true, that in the end, you're going to get people to see your perspective and they'll change. People are defensive. The people eating tasty animals, the funny thing about it is they have a hot sauce. No kidding. Uh, uh, people eating tasty animals hot sauce and it's vegan. Oh my gosh, the irony in that. <laughs> I think it's a mistake on their part, but there we are. Um, so... You know, they're just being defensive and they're just trying to find other ways. It's like, ho, 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 yes. Right. You know, go away. You're going to change. A lot of people you don't even think will change. And I have so many examples have changed and shocked me over the years that I thought, you, I never thought you would change your mind. But because people kept going, 
they did. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's part of the step, right? It's it's ridicule. You just have to embrace it at some point because it's just part of the process. Just like I'm sure people who stood up for African Americans to have the right to vote back in the day, like white people who stood up for African Americans, they probably didn't get good attention from the public either. Like, oh yeah. And, and on your second point. I never would have thought that I would have gone vegan. I tell you, I was the biggest meat eater back in the ah. day. Um, and believe it or not, um, I was actually a fan of PETA before I went vegan. Crazy, right? I used to go to a lot of, well, I s still do regard besides just like the COVID period, but I would go to a lot of concerts and I would go to big events like Warp Tour. Um, PETA was always there and I, I would stop and I would talk to them. I would, you know, talk to them about factory farming and all this stuff, and they would educate me as a meat eater. Um, so I would get like the little stickers they would hand out, slap them on my guitars and like rep them out. But um, I always thought that I was, you know, doing the right thing and that I was supporting humane meat. You know, I was thinking that because I wasn't supporting factory farming anymore, I was doing the right thing. Um, can you give us your thoughts on the humane meat and you know, what really is going on there? Well, you obviously always had a good heart. And if I'm in the grocery store and I see somebody who has a carton of eggs, for example, and a lot of these cartons of eggs, like Nellie's eggs, they have a green pasture and they have a little child holding a cuddly brown hen. Right. And it just looks as if there's endless grass. And it says things like, Organic, I tell people, organic only means no pesticides. That's all that means. doesn't mean anything humane. Or it says free range, or it says, you know, all, be skeptical. It's, you know about greenwashing. We should know about humane washing. Because places like Nellie's Eggs, and we've been inside Nellie's Eggs, we've seen them all crammed together. They say free range. That means that the thousands of them crammed together in a shed with about, you know, the size of a piece of typing paper or this screen as, as all the space they can, afraid to turn around because they might get pecked because they have no real pecking order anymore. They don't know who's aggressive and who's not aggressive. If they could fight their way to the four or six holes in the shed, just little openings in the shed and go through them, and those openings aren't even open when it's winter, when it's raining, at night. There's a, just a small window of time. If they could fight their way out, they would be in a dirt patch that's very, very small. That is not what those people who are buying those eggs imagine they are buying, and they've paid extra for them. So I say, you know, that's very nice of you. Thanks so much. Whole Foods has this whole bogus thing about gradations of humaneness. You know, go to a slaughterhouse, pick your slaughterhouse, anyone. Tell me about the gradations of the animals who are turning around if they can on the slaughter line, trying desperately to flap their way, flee out of that place, screaming and squawking, the blood, the smells. Tell me about your gradations of humane meat. So I always say to people, you're a kind person because you're buying this stuff. Here's a video, here's a link, here's a VSK, a vegan starter kit. Please, don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie. You don't need it. Your arteries don't need it. The environment doesn't need it. And the animals certainly don't need it. If you wouldn't do it to your dog, please don't buy this stuff. You are, it's the same as if you were doing these cruelties yourself. You're paying somebody, and I know you don't mean it, but please just get away from it. It's easy, I'll help you. Peter has got mentors, you know, any question you have, we'll answer, we'll help you in any way. And there is a taste alike for every single taste you like. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, like you said, I think, you know, people's hearts are in the right place, um, looking for better alternatives. And I think that's probably what I was trying to do. But I think now, you know, have, being vegan, having a clearer mind, it's, that word, humane slaughter, it's an oxymoron. And th those farmers, you know, some of them, they may treat their animals with respect. Like it may be like you're on a farm sanctuary, what, you know, if you're in that farm. But up until that point, that farmer puts that knife on that animal's throat. 
that, you know, that it's no longer a sanctuary for those animals. Um, so I think, you know, people really need to consider and, and watch some of these videos, like you said, that PETA has posted and to find out the truth of what really is going on in, uh, in all over the world in these farms. And um, actually, I wanted to ask you, how did you get into this kind of investigative kind of secret video? Well, I was in law enforcement, believe it or not. I was a deputy sheriff. Wow. So I was used to investigating crimes. And uh, we didn't have the sophisticated equipment that we have these days. But I knew how to gather evidence. I knew what you needed to make a criminal case. And these days, it's very hard to make a criminal case because even though the law doesn't exempt factory farms, unless they've passed one of these ag-gag bills to keep the public out, um, they've exempted themselves. So a prosecutor probably won't bring a case and a judge won't hear a case. But yes, um, I knew how to collect the photographs, the expert witnesses, the um, factual statements uh, to document everything. And so the Silver Spring Monkeys case was our very first case of an investigation. And I used to hide in a cardboard box in the parking lot with two holes for eyes in the box and a Radio Shack walkie-talkie <laughs> to no tell way. the person inside the lab if anyone was coming. That's how sophisticated it was. You're kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow, it's come a long way. It's come a long way. Uh, but we've always done them. We've done uh, hundreds of investigations. We've never, never been on a, a factory farm or in a laboratory where we have emerged saying, wasn't anything there to report. There's, everything is fine. Because I wish that anybody in these places treated animals with respect. But we have seen monkeys who are just screaming for their lives, monkeys desperate, their teeth chattering, being held down, slapped in the face by people for no reason other than power. The same power you see that some people exert against elderly people in a nursing home when they don't think anybody is looking is that or jailers against people who are in prison when they have the power and we've seen cats just slammed into the metal cage bars in a temper tantrum dogs kicked but the worst is to me what we've seen with the monkeys not because monkeys are so human but because i think people who control the monkeys who have the power over them recognize in them that I've got a little person here and I'm going to dominate and really do anything I want to this individual. And they know how similar they are and they can see the fear and the terror in their eyes and they want to just smirk and take up and hit them or whatever they do to them. So I don't, we've never found a situation where there hasn't been wrongdoing in any of these places, I regret to say. And, and I have to say the, the one thing that I hate the most in this world is w one person or one being take, using their power and taking advantage of someone who is weaker and more vulnerable. I, 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 I can't stand that. Um, but but on a more positive note, I think um, in, in even outside of the world of like meat and um, laboratory testing, you guys have done a lot of work and success working with many popular brands that people know uh, in fashion, as well as working with celebrities and getting them on board with your missions. Um, t talk a little bit about that and how you've um, gotten them to, you know, go more vegan and, and have more vegan products. Yeah, persistence. I think that's it. a lot of nagging, a lot of persuading. And that's where I take my hat off to all our members and supporters, because we'll put something on our website, the peter.org, and we'll say, we were just in Peru. For example, this is correct. We were just in Peru, which is the world's biggest supplier of alpaca wool. An alpaca became quite trendy. People wanted an alpaca coat or alpaca socks. And we found terrible cruelty to these gentle alpacas who were slammed onto the table and, you know, abused. And some of them are pregnant and it, it's just a horrible mess. So we went public and we asked our people, please go to The Gap, go to H&M, get on the websites, tell them, do not buy alpaca. And so everybody did. And 
um, anthropology has not moved. They need a lot of nagging. They need a lot of pressure from consumers. They need people to say, I'm not shopping at anthropology until you stop selling alpaca. But it's because of people power, the power of the purse. These companies all know that they want to sell you something. And so it depends what you want to buy and what you won't buy. And so that's up to us, everybody, to make it clear don't want anything that was stolen from an animal, nothing that was taken off an animal's back, nothing an animal had to be killed for. And you know, that's their clothing. The wool, the leather, the alpaca, the cashmere, the mohair, that's theirs. It's not ours, it's not humans. It belongs to them. They depend on it, it's there for a reason. I don't want to hear this, oh, will sheep have to be shorn, you know? Well, the only reason that they may have to be shorn is you've bred them so that they have so much wool and they're in the wrong climate. You know, if you didn't industrialize their use and steal from it, it would be fine. So it's the power of the purse, the power of the consumer, using your dollars that you buy food with, clothes, clothing with, household products, personal care products, everything you do either contributes to suffering or contributes to compassionate care and treatment of animals or just leaving them alone. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I love that. The power of the purse. It's it's so true. I mean, money talks. Um, and uh, I got to say, I love you guys' websites too. Um, you know, you always post vegan alternatives to pretty much everything. I just, I, I moved into a new home, uh, which is why I've been so busy lately. But um, one of the things I was looking for because I didn't have a mattress, I looked up vegan mattresses and you would be surprised, you know, there's animal products in the beds that we sl all sleep in every single day. Um, so I was amazed to find a, a nice vegan mattress on you guys website. Um, but yeah, isn't that crazy to think that animal products are everywhere and um, you really do have to educate yourself when when you're looking for these things yeah i'm glad you brought that up because people don't think about down the feathers of the animal and where do they come from they're not just out on the ground somewhere someone isn't out with a basket picking them up and making thousands upon thousands of mattresses out of them or pillows that's a big thing or comforters or jackets those wretched canada goose jackets which were popularized when there was the james bond film and somebody saw 007 and that Canada goose, and now everybody wanted one without a thought that that's a real coyote uh, that's part of that collar. And it's real geese. Geese are the gentlest life mates. They're, they're faithful, wonderful, what great parents. And here they're rounded up after their factory farm shoved into a truck. We followed them all the way and they go to the slaughterhouse and they cry out. They scream for their families and they're hung upside down, have their throats slit. And then their feathers go into the Canada goose jacket or into feather bedding. So we do have alternatives to every single thing you could think of. And the more we move away from it, because one industry supports the other. You know, the feather industry supports the goose meat industry, the foie gras industry, the forced force feeding to make a fatty liver supports the feather and the meat industry. And so when people say, well, they don't kill the cow for cheese, do they? Or they don't kill the cow for milk. I would say, where do you think that retirement home is for those cows? You know, I, I'm missing it. Where is it? Because when they have finished having their babies taken away, having their milk taken away, when they're in the least good health that they could be in when they're worn out they get kicked and prodded down the same ramp to their deaths as any so-called beef cow i mean they at the end of their lives they go the same way there is no retirement home leave them alone gosh that is a great way to put it where is this beautiful retirement home for these animals um yeah but i i tell you knowing that there are no animal products in my mattress that no animal had to suffer for me to go to bed. And well, actually, it's that saying, it helps me fall asleep at night better figuratively and literally in this case. So um, what do you think about like, because politics, it's a big, it's a big talk right now. And I think it has been for the last couple of years. And um, what do you think can be done on a political level? Um, is there any influence that could, you know, 
go up to the political level and possibly trickle down into law and any thoughts on that? Well, I'm a great believer in the grassroots. I believe that you change things from the bottom up. And when enough people care about something, no matter what it is, then politicians will listen because they know you vote or you supposed to vote. We are seeing some change, but you know, getting a bill, especially a federal bill passed is next to impossible because the bureaucracy moves so slowly, politics moves so slowly. However, I do believe that animal rights activists should be political. And that means going to all the candidates and making sure they know what you think about meat, about dairy, about animal-based agriculture, about experimentation. Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren have got a bill now that would ban factory farms in 2040. And people say to me, but 2040? And I say, yeah, but it's the first bill that's actually even broached this issue. We have members of the Congress who are now questioning the National Institutes of Health to say, since 95% of drugs don't work in human beings and cause side effects, why are you still allowing uh, animal tests? That's not the way to go. We want modern tests. And they're pushing. They're pushing at the moment for us to stop the forced drowning test of small animals that are used to test uh, antidepressants, which is the stupidest thing you could ever imagine. Wait, what? What uh, drug companies do, and the National Institutes of Health gives money, is for you given a small animal an antidepressant, and then you drop them into a beaker of water that has solid sides. And the animal is desperate. You know, they look around, they know they're going to drown. They dive down to the bottom, even if they've never swum before, to look for a way out. There isn't one. They claw at the sides. There is no way out. And they swim frantically until they give up. And somebody has a clipboard and they just show what time they gave up swimming, what time they lost all hope. And that is supposed to tell us something about the effectiveness of antidepressants. Now, oh if that, it's so ridiculous. And most of these experiments, a child could look at them and say, how do you think you're getting anything out of that? Yet they do them year after year, right. after year, after year, after year. And so we have members of Congress who are questioning that, who are questioning sepsis experiments on mice that do not work. The scientists say they do not work, but they keep getting funds. So you must go and see your representatives and you must push and don't take no for an answer. Don't take a form letter for an answer. Go back to them and say, that's not what I asked. Or do you know this? And we have all the facts on our website. So please, you know, politics are difficult. Politics are slow. But gradually, and we see with human rights how hopeless some of the things seem. But you can't just go, well, that's the way it is. You have to keep pushing forward for justice. Mm -hmm. And same with animal rights. Right. Yeah. For, I'm really appalled by that, by the way. I, I didn't know that actually was going on. It's going on now. Oh, yeah. In fact, Eli Lilly is one of the companies that we're targeting right now. We got Pfizer to stop. We've had uh, a number of other companies, GlaxoSmithKline to stop. Pfizer uh, stopped. Eli Lilly uh, is one of the, the chief antidepressant makers that still uses this test. And there's no reason for it at all. It's petrifying for those animals, gives us nothing, no information that we could possibly benefit from. Right. But, but I agree with you. It's, a, you know, the, the change typically, I guess, from my observation of, of history, it typically comes from the bottom up. Um, but I think voicing your opinion, too, and your thoughts and, you know, beliefs, you know, essentially your right to a fair life that you have to do that. You can never just accept the way things are um, because change needs to happen on a lot of issues, not just, you know, our, yeah. our veganism lifestyle, but, but a lot of things. So that's well said there. Um, I want to ask you over these last 40 years, looking back on all your successes, um, you know, would you have done anything differently? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a big question, but I'm really curious to see if, and here, if you, you know, 
would approach certain things differently or that would be telling <laughs> i'm not sure that we share the secrets of our strategy there are always things that you, in retrospect that you think oh, i didn't realize that was going to happen or that would strike that nerve or oh gosh if only we thought of this one thing before we did that so yes there are many things but i also know this that there is a thing we call death by committee is that you present an idea and if you've got enough people in the room or on the phone or wherever that idea will probably die because everybody's got an opinion as to why it might not work or it shouldn't work or it could be different so we don't do that right we listen to people's ideas but if we have the kernel of an idea we will try to find a way to make it work and the other thing of course that feeds into that is some people are too embarrassed to go forward with an idea or to say a particular thing or they don't think the time is right or whatever it is i always say when you don't do something you definitely don't win but if you do something some of the time you will win so you may not always succeed you may look like an idiot sometimes you may just think oh no why did i do that but if you don't do it there's no point in even beginning to think you're in a movement or you want some a different world so always i think try your hardest to do as much as you can absolutely yeah be bold and take risks right yeah and i mean look at the risks we have to take they're they're quite modest you know we're not living in a country where they'll hang you up by your heels and tear your fingernails out or you know lock you in a dungeon and decapitate you we have very little to risk you know if you'll get fired as that guy was on the bus and they made him give out the burger king coupons and he said not going to do it i'm a vegan and so they fired him he sued him he won you know everybody loves him and he didn't violate his ethics and he won his lawsuit and we're protected in so many ways we just have to not live our life as if we're just going to go along with things we just have to remember our own values and just keep finding ways to push them forward that's beautiful yeah and you know to see where we've come now where we can select like a million we have whole aisles of almond milk and soy milk and oat <laughs> milk and flaxseed milk it's amazing and now we have the beyond burgers and possible just the the options are endless right um, but there's still, I think, a, a lot more ways to, to go and a lot more work to do. Um, and so I really wanted to ask you, um, you know, where things are now. You, we talked about some of the experiments that are going on um, with animals and, you know, some brands still not on board with banning some of these animal products from, from their business. You know, what, what more needs to happen, in your opinion, to create a more vegan uh, and peaceful world? Well, if you know a child in school, or if you're a teacher, or you know a teacher, or whatever, there's this, we, we invested, I think, $150,000 to create this thing called the Sin Frog. It's a simulated frog, and it can be used in schools. People do know there's an environmental issue with taking frogs out of ponds, but the cruelty issue is horrific, the manner in which they're killed. I mean, nobody renders the frog unconscious before they kill them. They just dump them in formaldehyde. And that's a hideous, hideous death. So we have a synthetic frog, sin frog. It's a plastic, strange, I don't know, material. You cut it open with a scalpel. You can take out the little organs. You can reuse it. It's no formaldehyde, no dead frogs. And you can you know, use it for a long time. It's, it's economical. So if you know anything to do with teaching schools, children, there's that. The other thing, of course, is always to look at entertainment. There are some very bizarre entertainments that most people listening probably don't go to, like hog dog rodeos, where they drag pigs around an arena in Texas and, and the running of the bulls and so on. But if you go somewhere and someone says, want your picture taken with the parrot on your shoulder or the baby monkey? No, they're taken away from their homes. Want your feet uh, pedicure with little fish in a tank? No, because you can't clean the tank. And in the end, you're just going to toss them out when it gets dirty. And that's, they'll die on, flashing on, on the floor. Um, 
not going to SeaWorld or any of these aquariums, not going to roadside zoos, unless you're going to take photographs to give to us, to tell us what you saw so that we can bust them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's an animal in the equation, and it can be in a million different ways, I'm sorry to say, you have to ask yourself, do you think they like it? Do you think, are they volunteers? Would they be there if they had the option to leave? You know, where did they come from? These elephant orphanages in Thailand, they're not orphanages. The mothers are chained up, the babies are taken away. They're taught with barbarous means to do tricks like paint or play a musical instrument. Be suspicious. If there's an animal in the equation, ask yourself, do you think they want to be there really? And then just run screaming, don't support them. Exactly, and always try to put yourself in the shoes of others and I guess, you know, figuratively speaking, but you know, it, always try to take on the perspective of, of the ones that are the victims and then truly you can understand what they're going through. Well, I'm glad you said that because people always say to me, let me know, is Peter against this or is Peter against that? And I always say, well, it's really easy. You just have to ask yourself, if you were in that position, would you be for it or against it? No matter what it is, if it wasn't that lion or that rat or that chicken, or if it was you, would you think it was all right? And if the answer is, well, no, no, I wouldn't, then that's Peter's position too. We're against it as well. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Um, if somebody wants to go vegan or learn more about the work that you guys do at PETA, where can they go? Well, there's my book, Animal Kind, <laughs> but PETA.org should be a resource for anybody, for anything, for every cruel thing that is done, even inadvertently, there is a kind thing. And we have every resource on the website. If you can't find it on PETA.org, just ask us. We have vegan mentors. We have lists of cruelty-free cosmetics, lists of cruelty-free shoes and clothing, lists of vegan athletes who can tell you, lists of, of wonderful movies to watch, like Game Changers or Earthlings and so on. Anything you want, we are here for you. So PETA.org, Animal Kind, and good luck to everybody because everything is so important and everyone is so important to this movement. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll have the link to your book, to PETA's website down in the description below. Also, if you guys are looking for a great vegan mattress, definitely head on there and say <laughs> I'm very satisfied customer. Um, but thank you. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And, um, you know, here's to another 40 years and beyond. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. Thanks for what you do. Very important.